It was an incredible moment. Uh, I think I will remember it forever. The most material information in the world at that moment. And uh, the results are astonishing. Only when uh, I went back uh, home that evening, and I, I sat down and I took a glass of wine, this is only when the emotions really came, came, came out, and I had tears in my eyes. In the early months of the pandemic, Albert Borla's team needed two miracles. First, a vaccine that actually worked using unproven technology, but they also needed it now. When I first heard the news, I thought I misheard. They told me 90 and I thought they told me 19. They said, no, 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 90. Then I said, but what is the efficacy? And then they told me 95.6. And then I knew that this is, the world is changing. Borla handled personally the calls with world leaders, all of whom wanted greater supplies of vaccine than the company could provide. In your book, you write about many different world leaders, and you speak highly, glowingly, of, of almost all of them, but notably not so highly of Donald Trump. Um, what should I read into that? I think in his mind you represented the best hope to bring a vaccine before the elections. And if we could, we would. Because for me, a, a week earlier, it is life saved. Uh, eventually, the vaccine came a week later. That frustrated him. So from uh, having excellent relations, uh, we had zero relations, because I think in his mind, we could have done it faster and we didn't. We never spoke since then. All vaccine makers have faced the same challenge, and that is of, of misinformation. C correct me if I'm wrong, but, I, but I, I believe I've heard you talk about those who would deliberately peddle in misinformation as criminals. Is, is that something that you stand by, that you believe in? Yes, I, I do, because they are, they are literally cost lives. They know what that they are saying is lying, but they do it despite that. There is an article, a picture of my wife, uh, her, uh, I forced her to get the vaccine, and then because of the vaccine, she died. I realized that they had all of that lies, of course. And they did it, why? Because they wanted to convince people that they were on the fence to do the vaccine or not. Don't do it. Look, his wife died. But forget that. That's nothing compared to how many people didn't do the vaccine and died because of that. So they are criminals. Another large problem, vaccine equity. Pfizer has sold primarily to wealthier countries. Its revenue during the pandemic doubled to $80 billion. Its profits up 50% in just one year. And so came the call for Pfizer to share its secret recipe. The intellectual property side of this. You know where I'm going with this. There have been repeated calls imploring Pfizer to share the formula with the rest of the world. Why has Pfizer decided not to do that? It was never a question of uh, intellectual property, why we didn't have enough vaccines in the first half of 2021. It was lack of raw materials. It was not even infrastructure. We had built, and for those that they know even basic things about how sophisticated those technologies is, to say that uh, we can uh, transfer knowledge or we will have some countries in Africa start manufacturing this high tech, they are completely dreaming. This is not possible. Or is it? The World Health Organization is establishing a global mRNA hub in Africa with six countries set to receive the technology required to manufacture mRNA vaccines. Pfizer is also laying foundational groundwork in Africa, but only to produce its own vaccine. The vast majority of Africans have yet to receive even a single dose. There, there's an advocate who we've spoken to, an advocate for vaccine equity, but particularly in Africa. He has sort of a question about this, and I'm wondering if you could answer. So let's go ahead and play this for you. My name is Edward Ikwaria, and I'm the Africa Executive Director at The One Campaign. Mr. Albert Bola, Africa currently imports 99% of its vaccines. 
So why does Pfizer not support the regional hubs in Africa so that Africans can make their own vaccines for this pandemic and the next? No, I think he has a very fair point. And with mRNA, the question was something that had never been manufactured before in the world. We manufacture it at scale in the midst of a pandemic and trying to devote attention from the big centers that were making massive production for the whole world to try to do something in places that they don't manufacture even simpler forms that wouldn't be sustainable. So what is next? What does the next wave look like? What should we be preparing for? I mean, you know, there's a time when two doses was considered fully vaccinated. I have three. Will I need a fourth? What's next? I think what most of the people are asking right now, including the public and the experts, it is something that will last at least one year. I think there is a fatigue with, uh, I need to do an, a third or a fourth or a sixth. But we have good reasons to believe that we have found uh, good science that could lead us to this result. If that's true, I think we will be able to, to prove it in the next six to 12 months and then have something that uh, will, will take us for, uh, uh, for the years to come with just one annual revaccination. So a lot of activity right now, and uh, we are committed that we will never let go. Dr. Borla, this has been a wonderful conversation. Thank you for your time. Uh, excellent talk. Thank you very, very much. Have a nice day.